Welcome to our West Wharf workshop organized jointly with Complexity Science Hub Vienna and Buffy Bocconi University. Today's theme is the fight against COVID-19, effectiveness, efficiency, and trade-offs, stock taking and lessons for the final spurt. More than a year of COVID containment measures have yielded a rich collection of practical experiences across the globe. The measures adopted evolved through learning by doing, also peer learning played a big role. While containment measures were initially focusing on the preservation of public physical health, whatever the cost was a slogan used, trade-offs with economic costs, with civil liber liberties, children's education and mental well-being moved increasingly in the focus later on. Furthermore, resource scarcity and challenges of their use and distribution have substantially constrained the choice of containment decisions. Initially masks, FFP2 masks, then tests, vaccinations. We're just witnessing in countries like India or Brazil that this phase is even now not yet over if you take a global perspective. Finally, diminishing public acceptance of containment measures has influenced the effectiveness of measures over time, bearing in mind that an assessment of effectiveness and efficiency requires a clear view on the underlying aims of measures. This workshop provides an overview of existing state-of-the-art theoretical and empirical research as well as practical experiences of what has so far emerged to work best. So what are the themes and questions that we want to answer in this workshop? First, what are the objectives of COVID containment measures? Are they made sufficiently explicit, these objectives? If not, why not? To what extent can these objectives at least be derived implicitly? Second, what does theory and empirical research Tell us on the effectiveness and efficiency of various containment measures, for instance, with respect to saving lives. Third, what trade-offs are there between various containment goals, including over time with respect to public health, economic effects, public acceptance, etc.? Fourth, what role have resource and logistical constraints played? What role do they still play? What role does public acceptance of containment measures play in the choice of measures? How does public acceptance differ across countries and why? How has acceptance evolved over time and why? How to influence public acceptance? And finally, what are the challenges going forward in 2021 and beyond and how to deal with them effectively and efficiently? We have structured the workshop in two parts, as you saw on the program. Part one is focused on the effectiveness of COVID containment measures. After one year of COVID containment evidence, what works best? David Mackey, who has himself written substantially and quite a bit on the, on the theme, uh, will chair this uh, session. After one hour in part two, we will deal with efficiency. There, we will focus on economic costs, various trade-offs, and public acceptance. With this, I hand over to David Mackey, who will chair session one on effectiveness and best practices of COVID containment measures. David. <clears throat> Thank you, Ernest. Um, and it's great to welcome you to this first session of this workshop, one year of COVID containment evidence, what works best. I'd particularly like to welcome the panel members um, Stefan Therner from the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna, Sebnem Kameli Ozkan from the University of Maryland, and Anna Petherick from Oxford University. Okay, so let me start. So uh, our work uh, is about making the economic case for global vaccination. So we did this paper uh, in January. This is a presentation from February. Uh, we have presented on January 26th at a press WHO press conference with Dr. Tedros, 
Uh, and this is pretty much the first paper that makes the economic case for global vaccination. And the uh, intuition comes from the fact that we live in a globalized world connected through trade and finance. So let me go through what we do and summarize the results very quickly in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. We know that COVID has been a catastrophe in terms of lives and livelihoods. Vaccines, of course, game changer uh, and can stop the pandemic in a given country. Since the first vaccine news arrived in November uh, 2020, this was the approach taken, actually. It was a very nationalistic, country-specific approach. And we would like to make the case in the paper that given the global interconnections between countries, even a country achieves universal vaccination of its citizens, that country is still going to suffer economically as long as the rest of the world is not vaccinated. And I really want to be very clear here. When we wrote this paper uh, uh, in January, there was already, uh, you know, two months after the vaccination, and there was already a moral and ethical case. Clearly, it is a, you know, our moral responsibility in rich countries uh, to make sure the vaccine production and supply increases, and we also share the extra supply we have in our rich countries with the rest of the world. So that, that the ethical moral side is clear. But uh, the economic case uh, wasn't made before our work, and we just want to make sure it is also economically in the best self-interest of the rich countries uh, to uh, approach this as a global uh, phenomena with a multilateral approach. So our work basically puts these numbers on the table, right? So I, I am sure people also realize that there will be economic cost of not uh, vaccinating the rest of the world. It's just that there weren't any numbers before our work, and we, we put numbers on this. So what we do is estimating the economic impact of not vaccinating poorer nations on richer nations, how much of the global cost the rich nations bear, even if they achieve universal vaccinations in their own economies, and which sectors in rich economies are especially vulnerable. So the framework is going to be a data-driven framework. It's going to be very rich in country sector heterogeneity. So we are going to combine an epidemiological model, the, the, the epidemiological model that you guys all seen since last year, we are going to combine that. We are going to turn it into a sectoral model first, because as we know, different sectors are going to be hit differently from COVID. And then we are going to combine it with data, sectoral data on international and intersectoral uh, trade and production linkages. So on the supply side, what is going to happen is uh, in your own country, of course, you are going to have sick workers and that sickness is going to depend on if your workers are going to be working uh, te with telework or not, and if they are if they, on the site, if they are uh, they require physical proximity or not. So that type of sector heterogeneity is going to give you how the pandemic is going to evolve in your country. Then that domestic labor supply is going to be combined with imported intermediate inputs because in every country you use also imported intermediate inputs. And here we are going to follow the theoretical work of a very influential theoretical work of. Baki and Fahri, and now their first paper is in Econometrica, a closed economic paper, assume the entire production function. What does it mean is we are doing this for the very short run. All our estimates is 2021. Uh, and in that short run, there's going to be strong complementarity between inputs and the labor. Okay, and the evidence we have before on this uh, is the earthquake uh, papers that use earthquake shocks, for example, in Japan, and how uh, and show that how global supply chains disrupted the next six to eight months after the earthquake. So we are going to follow that uh, strategy and say, okay, uh, you start as of December 2020, you know that you have vaccines, but the pandemic is going to evolve differently in 2021 in different countries, as we see now in India uh, versus US versus Europe. And during this process, there's going to be these vaccinations in say US, but not in India. And given that the production and trade is linked between con these countries, what is going to happen in terms of uh, economic cost? Uh, on the demand side, you know, there is going to be foreign and domestic demand fluctuating, again, function of infection. So clearly, if you are vaccinating very fast in US, your demand is going to improve, but uh, domestically, but you know, if you are selling goods to in India and India is in recession, then your foreign demand is going to collapse. Okay, so we are going to bring in both sides, the domestic demand and foreign demand. And as I said, everything is going to be a function of infections because we have a full-fledged epidemiological model. In fact, we are going to turn that model to sectoral. And we will also have endogenous lockdowns. For example, uh, if you are a country where your severe cases passes your ICU capacity, and we get this data from WHO and John Hopkins, then as a country, you are going to put an endogenous lockdown. 
uh, as a function of that. And then demand is going to normalize when your active cases is going to be less than certain fractional population. And all this data is basically uh, based on the experience we had in 2020. Okay, so we are going to calibrate this uh, based on the 2020 experience. And the open economy dimension, as I said, because infection dynamic is going to determine countries own supply and production and own demand by sector at sectoral level, that means that's going to determine exports and imports, not only final goods, but also intermediate goods. Okay, so that's basically the paper and how we do this, how we, you know, uh, bring this uh, idea uh, to the data. We are going to use the OECD global trade and production network data. So this we are using as of 2019. So the assumption here is like you enter, uh, sorry, as of 2020. So you, which is basically as of 2019, it's the same. So the global production and trade work is not changing. Okay, so you enter the pandemic with a given network and then you find the vaccines at the end of first year. What happens in the second year, given the fact that now you have vaccines and you still operate within this network. Okay, and this is a very standard uh, short run assumption. You know, there are rigidities in the short run output is going to be uh, the demand determined, but there's a supply constraint here, which is time varying based on the infection dynamic. Okay. So what you see here on the slide is the linkages between countries. These are the trade linkages on the left in blue and big countries are in the uh, uh, squares. Dark blue means very open countries like, you know, obviously European countries are more open than US here. Uh, and the, 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 the uh, thickness of the arrows is also going to give you the size of the trade countries that trade a lot with each other, like Malaysia and Singapore is going to have much thicker lines. Now, the countries that has a black box around them are the vaccinated countries here. So basically all the rich countries plus China is going to be assumed vaccinated and the rest, the emerging markets and developing countries, we are going to assume not vaccinated again for 2021. Okay, and we are going to run some different scenarios uh, saying, well, okay, what if there is some vaccination and, and so forth. Now, within this global trade network, you have to embed this uh, right figure in uh, orange and pink and red. That's the sectoral linkages. So this is actually uh, something that captures both a structure relationship, the fact that if you are putting a car, you need chips. And as we know, now there's a chip and semiconductor shortages and global supply chains are disrupted in this sense. And that's why we are stopping all sorts of car production. So that's, that's kind of a structure relationship, right? You need that to produce the car. But also there is an endogenous trade relationship. You buy some of these inputs from other countries. So this is what this network shows. So the arrows is going to show who is buying from who. The colors are going to show if you buy a lot from other countries or less, like, you know, uh, for example, coke and petroleum products is going to be a very tradable sector as opposed to construction. But the point is, even you are a light pink sector, less tradable, like wholesale, retail and construction, if you are very central in the network, like wholesale and retail, you are still going to be affected when the other countries are not vaccinated. Okay, that type of non-linearity and amplification is the nature of this network. So you are going to embed this figure inside this blue figure. That's going to give you a uh, 2,275 by 2,275 matrix of a network of 35 industries and 65 countries. This is the entire global trade and production network. Then we basically do two exercises. We ask how much global and local amplification can we get from a health shock? I mean, let's not forget that this is a health shock. So it is going to affect, you know, uh, labor supply and demand, right? Uh, and uh, we we first say how much, you know, effect is going to be there when there isn't this uh, international, intersectoral, uh, international and intersectoral linkages, how much, and then we put them in and we ask how much amplification will get given this link. Okay, so basically the first specification assumes there isn't any international production network amplification. So this is no IPN case. We still assume the demand shock is there, right? Demand is going to go down both domestically and foreign countries, foreign demand. Uh, this is going to depend on infections and the speed of vaccination. So demand can go up and down, right? It's going to fluctuate. But the thing is, there's also a foreign demand component here. So that's going to be there. In the first specification, because we don't allow amplification through international production network, intermediate input decline affecting the domestic production is not going to be there. We don't have that case. And then, so the, the only uh, health effect here comes through the fact that your own workers in your own country can be sick. Of course, if you are vaccinating everyone, you get rid of that shock, that labor supply shock. In the second case, we will allow full fledged amplification through international production networks. Still, we have the demand shock side, both domestic and foreign demand can go up and down. 
Now, on top of that demand story, now we are going to have this supply constraint coming from the fact that you import intermediate inputs to produce and you may not import them because you know that country is sick. And in fact, today in the news, you see that uh, a lot of uh, imports of intermediate inputs are going to be stopping now out of India. This happened before Brazil, for example, US construction industry has to slow down a lot because they cannot import the steel and lumber and all that. So this, I mean, this is just what we are capturing is what has been going on since in January on the ground in real life, basically. Then this scenario is going to give you full amplification through this inter-country and inter-industry input output linkages. So the way vaccination enters to this world is by getting rid of these shocks, right? If you are vaccinating everyone in your country, you don't have labor supply shock and your demand normalizes. Okay, so let me give you uh, some numbers and then I'm going to conclude. We do two, three cases. So we are going to assume immediate full vaccination in advanced economies and uh, no vaccination in emerging markets and developed economies. And we do those cases under no lockdowns, which is going to, of course, make the supply shock worse or uh, 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 less worse if there's no lockdowns or endogenous lockdowns in the second case where if you have so many cases, you have to lock down your economy as happening in Europe right now. And we focus a third case where there is full vaccination in advanced economies only by the mid 2021. And this is the realistic case scenario now for US, maybe not so for other rich countries and half vaccination emerging market and developed economy sometime in 2021. Okay, because there are there are vaccinations going on. So, and there is going to be endogenous lockdowns only if your ICE capacity is breached. Under this case, which is our benchmark case, so we work out if there is amplification through intention production networks, the last column here on the slide, or if there is no amplification, then there is no amplification through this in imports of intermediate goods, then the only loss in US as a rich country you observe is through loss export earnings, right? That is the, because you are only affected from demand side. If that is the case, then the loss to the world is going to be 2 trillion and 21% of that is going to be paid by rich countries. And that's uh, around 0.59% uh, of pre-pandemic GDP. However, if there's amplification through these global supply chain disruptions, when you really have to slow down your production because you cannot get your imported intermediate inputs, then the cost to the world is four trillion and half of that is going to be shared by rich countries. And here rich countries are vaccinating themselves, right? So still they are sharing 49% of this four trillion cost and that is 2.7% of their pre-pandemic GDP. So that's definitely not peanuts. The last point I want to make, make is the sexual heterogeneity, how we really identify everything from sexual heterogeneity. If you look at the figure on the right here, you are going to see the sectoral ranking in terms of GDP loss in unvaccinated emerging market and developing economies. So this is a box plot to show you the variation by country, but basically the rankings of the sector here on the right is a typical figure that you see many times right, right now. What is that? The, the bottom sector here with the loss that can be as high as 60% of that sector on average around 30% is going to be accommodation and food services. This is the story of your restaurants closed and your gyms closed and your movie theaters closed. The second sector that is losing a lot is arts and entertainment and recreation. This is a ranking when the pandemic is still going on in your country. And when you color code sectors as tradable and non-tradable, tradable, blue, non-tradable, it doesn't really matter, right? This ranking is about the fact that you have domestic pandemic in your country. Whereas if you vaccinate in your own country, now look at the left, this is the figure for vaccinate advanced economies. The, the ranking of these sectors changed tremendously. Now these sectors like accommodation, food, arts and entertainment, they have very small loss, okay? In fact, the maximum loss in those sectors are denoted with these vertical black lines here. You can see very, very little. Why? Because your restaurants open, your gyms are open, everybody's out because you vaccinate everybody. Okay, great. But certain sectors that are really connected to the global trade and production network, such as wholesale and retail, agriculture, fishing, transport and storage, and manufacturing, of course, are going to have a lot of losses. Manufacturing is not a surprise, the tradable sector, but look at wholesale and retail. It, that sector can have a loss up to almost 18% of its output. And here I, I will show you two countries, Netherlands and US. Netherlands is a more open country, so Netherlands is going to have higher losses in tradable sectors, but US, even not that an open country with the blue diamond here, you can see up to 15% loss in these not so tradable sectors because of the connections to the rest of the world and because of the connection to the other sectors that import a lot intermediate inputs. And here's some news uh, lately uh, about how much disruption we are having in global supply chains. I mean, so far I count, I'm just giving you some examples here, but since January there were over 
60 articles only in New York Times and Financial Times in terms of the global supply chain disruptions. So this is something going on ground. All the CEOs are talking about it. Uh, all the you know, shipping industry is talking about it. It's just that it is hard to capture this type of global supply chain disruption in aggregate trade data. You might see an improvement in aggregate trade, but you might at the same time have an ongoing global supply chain disruption. Of course, at some point, this is going to be reflected in price and it's already started. If you look at the lumber price in the construction sector, that is really, really hit. It is now triple since January. So it is going to be reflected in price and this is actually part of the inflation worry. But the point is our estimates are weekly. So any disruption in the global supply chain during 2021, even they improve later on, is going to add to these costs, right? I mean, when our workers get sick in our model, they get back to work in 14 days. And if some sort of uh, production stops and then that input cannot be sent, it will be sent at some point, it will be smoothed out. But still, all these disruptions is going to add to this cost, which you end up with a four trillion cost at the end of 2021, because of this effect where half of it is paid by the uh, rich countries. And if you look at the latest news pieces, the, the head uh, CEOs of the major companies, part of the global supply chain, interviewed that they are waiting, they are expecting these things, these disruptions going to go on till the fall of 2021. So if that really happens, then all our estimates are going to be valid because all our estimates is pretty much from January to December of 2021. To conclude, we demonstrated the economic case for global vaccinations on top of the, of course, very important moral case. Global costs can vary from one to six trillion depending on which channel is going to be strong, where advanced economies can bear from 13% to 49% of that global cost, okay? So again, I mean, this is a case where you hope for the best and prepare for the worst. I mean, since the start of the pandemic, I always say we are always behind and virus is always ahead. And if we somehow can fix this global supply chain disruptions, then the costs are going to be only 1 trillion and only 13% is going to fall on advanced economies. This is coming from the export side, right? I don't think, I mean, you know, US consumers can have all the demand in the world right now, but when countries are having like all these people dying, they are not going to be buying all the US goods. So the export uh, performance that US is expecting from a recovery is, is not going to be, at least in the first six months of 2021, uh, as, as usual, okay? And that's going to give you a 1 trillion loss, 13 pay, percent paid by the advanced economies, full disruption in global supply chain, full amplification through international production network, you go up to 6 trillion cost, 49% uh, is uh, falling on the advanced economies. So our result is again, just showing that no economy is an island and economies are connected to global trade and finance through complex networks and linkages. So the potential loss to advanced economies can be larger than the investment needed in the global vaccination in initiatives, such as COVAX. These initiatives are about increasing the supply and production, right? These are they're never about, okay, there is a fixed supply of vaccines, so only vaccinate 20% of your population and send the rest. We are not saying that, okay? We are definitely not saying uh, what has been argued in uh, some countries, or oh, we should just like do some and then share rest. No, we are, we, are, we are not operating under this type of fixed supply of vaccine because that, that's, the, that's the wrong way of thinking. We are saying the supply and production of the vaccine should be increased. There is already an initiative on ground like COVAX on that, and there are others, and rich countries should invest in this because that investment is going to be the best interest of advanced economies. Given the extent of globalization, no economy fully recovers until every economy recovers, and multilateral approach is a must to solve this pandemic. So here I want to say something. Globalization amplified this pandemic, that's for sure. At the end of the day, we are talking about a virus that travels, right? But globalization is also the only solution to the pandemic. So here we are at a moment where a multilateral approach is so important and international institutions such as the IMF, World Bank, WHO, WTO, and you know they have been working very, very hard. Uh, they have to be you know, really given power and the resources needed so we can, and also G20, I guess, like all the international bodies that can work at it uh, so that we can solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. Is Stefan ready? Okay, thank you for having me. And um, I'll, I'll talk about the effectiveness of different non-pharmaceutical interventions that governments have done in the world. I'll run you through uh, two projects that we did in that context, uh, two projects out of 20 that we ran 
in March and April for assisting um, the ministries in Austria and the prime minister's office. So the first thing we, we um, did is to start uh, producing a database of which non-pharmaceutical intervention was taken where at what time. This is the case of Austria. You see the timeline and um, the days where a specific measure was taken. So the different colors mean different uh, themes. So the yellow one is risk communication or uh, the, the pink one is introducing public health interventions. And um, you see that typically interventions happen in bundles and are adapted all the time. So this, this is the more or less the same thing. Other themes like travel restrictions, when were they imposed, social distancing measures. And the blue dots that you see is the, the percentage of increase in infections per day. We did this uh, also for the second wave. This is a little bit different um, presentation. The dots here is the, is the uh, whenever a certain um, measures were taken. Red means social distancing, for example. Uh, turquoise is risk communication. Green is taking out the measures again, returning to normality, meaning uh, stopping uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So we did this for about 200 countries in the end. This is the regions in the world where we took the samples, not everywhere we could get reliable data. We structured the data into eight themes, 60 categories and 500 subcategories, where a subcategory is really now at a fine grade um, level. For example, closing kindergartens would fall into one of these categories. Without vaccines and antiviral medication, NPIs were or are the only option to control viral spread. Uh, in the first wave, most governments uh, implemented highly restrictive NPIs under great scientific uncertainty. So it was not known if that was necessary. And it's um, now turning out maybe uh, the NPIs were too hard in the first wave. Uh, in many countries, we look at three different databases, not only our, ours but uh, also the, the, the Oxford database and the uh, CoronaNet database, in total with about 50,000 implementations of non-pharmaceutical interventions in more than 200 countries. We tried to disentangle the effect of the different measures, which were almost always implemented in bundles on the temporal reproductive number R effective of T. And we tried to correlate these measures with four different methods. Two of them are um, machine learning techniques, two are just uh, traditional uh, regression uh, setups. We did a great deal of validation. This was the central uh, message from, from this first paper that came out. What you see on the, on the, on the, on the plot is the color is the theme where the measure belongs to, and you see the value zero there, and then you see the value that is shown on the x-axis is delta R. So how much is the R effective reduced if you would implement just this single measure? So we have disentangled the, the strength of the effects from this immense mess. And therefore we had to use this kind of AI methods to, to find and detect patterns that sta statistically stably would come out of this. What did we find? We have the ranking in terms of, of the, the reduction of um, our effective. If you forbid small group gatherings, that has the strongest effect of 0.3. The second thing is closing schools, clo universities, colleges, and, and kindergartens. Third one is, is border restrictions. Third, fourth one is masks uh, and other personal protection equipment, et cetera. You can run down and go through that list in detail. In a nutshell, the most effective things are to close everything where people meet in small groups for extended periods of time. That includes offices, schools, restaurants, bars, 
movement restrictions, work, and increasing healthcare capacity, meaning masks, basically. That works. Also effective, but much less effective, is risk communication. It matters when you implement the measures. It matters greatly. Time matters. Context matters. We used our results and regressed them against a set of macroeconomic variables or, or other, other variables like population, density, GDP, human development index, political stability, and maybe a dozen others. We find that certain contexts really do matter, like GDP, corruption, regulatory and government effectiveness. Many countries imposed curfews and individual movement restrictions, which were criticized a lot. How much do they contribute to a reduction of our effective? What was interesting to see is that they don't bring as much reduction as one would think. The extra effect of a curfew when already other measures are in place is not that big. What I've shown you up to this point was the analysis of the first wave. What I show you here is also focusing on the first wave. A different work by colleagues of ours from Stanford, they come to extremely similar results of ranking. I show you just one detail in the gastronomy sector. What they did is they used mobility patterns from cell phone data to see what happens if you have um, uh, less mobility by closing uh, restaurants or bars or motels, etc. Um, how much reduction you can expect there. So very similar. If you close gastronomy is going hand in hand with a huge reduction of uh, our effective. There's a recent study, one month old or six weeks old, on the second wave. The measures work less well because many measures are already in place. So many changes that have now uh, taken place in the second wave are effectively showing less effectivity. But still, if you close um, places that are not absolutely necessary, like leisure, entertainment, etc., nightclubs, gastronomy, you see that by closing gastronomy, for example, you have a reduction of, I don't know, 10, 15 percent. What is very interesting, if you ban small meetings, small gatherings, you have to ban everything above two. If you're banning uh, above 10, there's no effect anymore. So that's a, that's a very clear message. It's, it's uh, already confirmed now by a Norwegian study again. Nightlife has a stronger effect uh, than we have seen, 15% reduction of our app. That is just confirming that if you're closing small group gatherings, you have to limit meetings to two people. Okay, what's happening in schools? We see that uh, you have to differentiate by age. You get a, a big effect for everyone above 10. Below 10, it's, it's practically insignificant. To add to the discussion of how to open schools in Austria, we did an agent-based simulation of, of schools, of typical schools in Austria. You see here a school where you see the classrooms, the teachers in the teaching room and the, the families of children. And we, we use these kind of networks uh, in a uh, typical SIR variant uh, where we also allow the, for the types of testing, for the speed of, of isolating people, for uh, varying the, the time for the test result and for putting people into isolation once they are um, infected. And we, we calibrated it with the actual rates of infection in the population that we bring in through the parents and through the siblings of the children into the schools. With this, we could show how a strategy of opening schools on a, on a sustainable path is possible. Here's the different combinations of, of measures that you should implement and what the expected reduction of infections is if you combine the different things you can do, like measuring like wearing masks, testing two times per week, or combining things. So and you see, if you're combining measures, you can get the situation perfectly under control. So the take home message is it is possible. That was not clear in the beginning uh, to disentangle the effectiveness of individual MPIs from, from all the MPIs that were actually implemented.
significant effectiveness you get if you keep gatherings very, very small. If you close gastronomy, that's by far the biggest contributor and education also of children that are older than 12. Minor effects are really strict curfews, opening theaters with distance, with masks, etc. have only very minor contributions to our effective. And also what, what seems not to be um, so important is, is the type of mask that you wear. So there's the first results now coming in that stricter mask policies, like switching to FFP2 has an effect, but is not as strong as um, many have speculated before. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much, Stefan. Um, Anna, are you ready to go? I'm going to briefly talk to you a little bit about um, the tracker project. Um, and you're probably very familiar with the fiscal stakes of what's going on, but just to show you one or two graphs. And then um, towards the end, I'll just show you some patterns that we see in the data, um, patterns in the policies um, implemented and, uh, and eased over time, but also patterns in human behavior um, while the policies have been put in place. So the tracker project, um, like the project we just heard about, um, has uh, a huge number of volunteers and they are coding in real time. The data is available in real time. Um, the idea is that we produce essentially a time series data set, which makes it very user friendly. And uh, by having a, a central code book, we can compare all of the policies put in place around the world. Now, our aim was really to do this to allow policymakers and researchers to answer two key questions. Uh, one is about the effects that government responses have in terms of disease, in terms of all sorts of different things, including economic effects. And the other one was to try and understand a bit more about what leads governments to adopt different kinds of policies. And so currently uh, the data sets has 20 different policy areas coded. Um, we use usually an ordinal scale for each of these, and we combine uh, groups of the 20 indicators into different kinds of indices to give a sense of policy strength in different areas. Um, we have a data set that currently covers pretty much the entire world, going back to the 1st of January 2020, but we also have a lot of subnational coding going on at the moment. And this is actually a huge proportion of our effort when you think about the number of jurisdictions you need to code. For example, in Brazil, we have 81 jurisdictions coded, which is getting close to uh, you know, between um, a third and a half of the countries in the world. We have all of the states of the US, where we just about to release China, and we're working incredibly hard on India right now. We also have in the works a big global cities data set. Um, and so the key to keeping all of this together is really to have the right kind of culture. Um, we don't pay anyone, so we have to keep spirits up. And um, and it's you know it's it's been an incredible learning curve and the most positive team experience that I've ever been part of to be around this pro-social group. Now, the way that our data is often used to um, to inform policy is to think about the strength of policy relative to the disease threats currently. And this is what I've presented here is one way of doing that from one of our, our recent working papers. So what we have here is the strength of policy on the y-axis. And we have the number of cases per 100,000 people on the x-axis for lots of different Brazilian cities. So all of the state capitals and the second, cap the second cities in each Brazilian state. And, you know, the WHO's advice has always been to, that lockdown should be used very selectively. They're very expensive. Um, they're very hard for, for, um, for people potentially to sustain. They're tough on educational outcomes and so on. So they really should be um, short and sharp and only when community transmission is out of control. So here, we essentially, we look at that and we have the last three months of 2020 along the top, 
and the first three months of 2021 along the bottom. Now, if you want to compare the strength of policy and the number of cases, what the idea, the basic idea, right, is that if you have a lot of cases, you should have strong policy. So as cities drift towards the right of each chart, they should also drift up on the y axis. And in short, um, we don't see a very clear pattern of that in Brazil, um, particularly if you look at March, which is the bottom right hand chart, when uh, the epidemic was, was really out of control in Brazil, frankly. Now to just um, give you some um, graphs that aren't our graphs, but you know the stakes all too well. These are just some graphs that show, in, in this case, changes in real GDP, comparing last year, 2020, for lots of different countries, to 2009, the Great Recession, if you'd like, and just to give a sense of the economic impacts that, that we've seen last year. Um, and then another chart looking at change in the government's fiscal balance. So, you know, at, when you produce an index like the stringency index, um, of people often assume that you have a theory of change that you want to impose on the world, that strong policy is necessary, good policy. And what we do really is, is describe what's going on. And it's worth um, reminding people of, you know, that this, these kind of costs will have very long term impacts on, on human well-being as well. Now, some more patterns in our data um, from various papers that we produced. When we look at um, last year and we look at the moment when policies were first enacted. So here we have time along the bottom. We have different world regions. And we have the strength of policy indicated by the density of the red colour. So we see that uh, in a two week period, basically in early March, around the time that WHO declared a pandemic, we see a sudden shoot up in red or in all regions of the world, pretty much. Now, the WHO's advice was that uh, the, the imposition, if you like, of strong closure policies should follow the risk of, the, of locally the extent of spread of the disease. And we indicate that here by the first 10 deaths, which is a dot for each country again in time. So what we should see if the world is following the WHO's advice is that the dense red colors should really be exactly where the dots are for each country. And that's not what we see at all. We see this kind of herd behavior among countries in terms of the, um, the moment when policy is first enacted. And then we can also look using our data at the, the sequencing of policies ramping up and reducing over time. So on the left hand panel here, we have the proportion of countries adopting a particular kind of policy as law. And then we have the number of days after the first requirement for some sort of closure came in. And essentially the left hand panel shows um, parallel lines rather than crossing over lines. So there's a sense of um, a common sequence to the way that policies are brought in by countries all over the world. And we can also see that it takes about two months for income support and debt relief policies to come in after the first requirement policies are put in place. So it took the world quite a long time to do that. When we start looking at the rollback of policies, which is the right hand panel. So here day zero is not the first, uh, first requirement for a policy, but five days of continuous reduction in, in policy strength. For the closure policies, which are colored, we tend to see the same kind of common sequencing, so parallel lines decreasing. But when it comes to, um, as you'd expect, um, the contact tracing, the testing and the public information, they stay level over time. But interestingly, also, the yellow lines in the right hand panel are income support and debt relief. And even though the closure policies are being reduced, those have held steady, um, which is an interesting point. Now, this chart here, we're particularly interested when we think about costly policies in stay at home orders, because what we've essentially found is that when we look not at the first instigation of stay at home order orders, but when they've been reimposed again, that countries have very different levels of sensitivity um, to the moment when they decide to reimpose these orders. So here we have essentially the countries with more than 
uh, an average daily case rate of more than 100, and the, which are the red countries, and those with less than 100. And essentially, we see that relative to the, the, the number of cases when they imposed a stay-at-home order for the first wave, we see that those that have, on average, had very few cases have become increasingly sensitive. So the moment that just a few cases have come along, they tend to impose a stay-at-home order. Those are the blue countries. But the red countries that have had a lot of cases over time tend to get, um, I guess, uh, desensitized to high levels of cases and are much less ready to impose stay-at-home orders. Now, the blue countries also, just as a sort of marker of success, we also see that these tend to be the countries that have done a really good job of test, trace and isolate. And then when we've combined our data with behavioural data of different types, um, we can start to look at how compliance varies over time. Now, this is, uh, these are some graphs where we've combined our data with survey data from YouGov and Imperial College, and their surveys have been run in lots of countries. Um, we used the data because it was only good enough in 14 countries every two weeks. And what we do here is essentially compare compliance over time with a baseline of the first month of lockdown. It's the first month since um, closure requirements were put in place. So along the bottom, we essentially have months of these graphs. And then the way to read these graphs is the zero line on the, on the y-axis, the dotted line, is our baseline compliance in that first month. So in the left-hand panel, we see two type, types of physical distancing. And with each month that passes, at least for the, the first few months, we see a decrease in compliance over time. And then a slight sort of banana shape, almost a slight kick up, which I can talk more about in a discussion uh, in terms of trying to explain. For mask wearing, we don't see that pattern at all. We see an increase in compliance over time. And because we're controlling for policy strength here, the way to think about this is that people have been adopting mask use far more quickly and in a more sustained way than the policies have required them to do. Now, to tip, sort of make sense of what's going on here, you can think of the physical distancing policies as, as very um, costly on an individual basis, whereas mask wearing is, a, is something that is rather more like wearing a, uh, a seatbelt or a helmet. It's a habituating behaviour, it's a low-cost behaviour. And so what the way we, we think about these patterns is to think about it really like a behavioural economist would, um, rather than purely explain it out of, for example, people perhaps res responding to the risk of disease. If that were the case, we would see similar patterns for different kinds of behaviours. And that's a very simple way to put it. In these charts, we're not controlling for other things like the weather or disease risk or so on. We've run those models, but these patterns essentially hold. And then to show you some very similar graphs, but now using uh, the Google mobility data for um, the time spent in residences and retail and recreation, which are probably the best uh, mobility indicators for individual choices. Um, what we've done here is produce those graphs, very the same set of graphs as before for physical distancing, but to split countries into countries with below median and above median levels of two types of trust institutional trust and interpersonal trust. Now, um, these are measures of trust before the pandemic, and certainly most of the attention in terms of research or and policy expectation has been that countries with high institutional trust would see more compliance over time, um, and simply because people trust their governments and do what their governments tell them to do. When we look at the, um, so the high institutional trust countries in the, in the left-hand panels are the blue ones and the, the low institutional trust countries are the black ones. And we essentially see compliance patterns month by month that are very similar for these two groups. So there isn't really a, a kind of compliance dividend for, for countries with high trust in government, at least before the pandemic. When we, however, compare countries of the above and below levels of interpersonal trust. This is trust in strangers in your country. We see divergence. So here, countries where people have a lot of trust in strangers in their countries tend to, if you like, hug closer to that zero compliance line, that baseline, 
that in, from the first month in countries where people don't really trust strangers. And the way that we, we are thinking about explaining this is to really refer to collective action theory. So if it's an individually costly thing to do physical distancing, to, um, to stay at home, to not go out and do retail and recreation, then you are only going to pay that individual cost. It's only worthwhile if you expect that others in your country are also doing the same thing. If you don't trust other people to do the same thing, the public good of a lower infection rate is probably not going to be produced. And so what's the incentive for you to do that too? Okay, um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Well, thank you to each of the panelists. Your papers have raised a number of questions in my own mind and I'm sure in other people's minds, but unfortunately we've used up our time. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll pass, I'll pass it back to you, Ernest. Let me cordially thank all the speakers for their presentations, for the interesting insights that they shared with us, but also to all participants for your interest. Bye-bye and take care.